Hello, it's Scott Manley here with Kerbal Spaceships, our serious business, part 10. Now, we have indeed made it into double digits, presuming, of course, that you have 10 fingers. If you have 12 fingers, you may not consider this double digits, but who am I to judge you? Anyway, we had this bit of debris left over from previous missions. Now, I wanted to deorbit it, but I didn't have actual engines on it for anything other than the reaction control system. But... I bet you didn't know that you can actually perform this kind of weird oscillating back and forth. And you see that what I'm doing in each case is I'm pushing the periaps lower and lower every time because I'm only ever thrusting in one direction. I'm just alternating the direction of rotation. So assuming you're using reaction thrusters for this, you can actually still deorbit an object even if you don't have thrusters that provide linear thrust. Anyway, it is rather tedious, so it's really only for those people that are OCD about LEO debris. But that, of course, includes me. Anyway, you'll notice that this has nitrous oxide as its reaction control system. Uh, we, are, we have just kind of got to the point where we've unlocked something better, and we're going to use that in our next spaceship. So yeah, we have this contract to put a spacecraft into a polar orbit, 700 kilometers. We also have a lunar flyby, which, uh, well, we missed the first time, but we think we'll get in the second time. So while I'm going to do this polar orbit, we should get some other stuff, such as science data from around the Earth. We can do the, the, sounding, the sounding rocket high is too high. That's 4,800 kilometers. We're not going up that high. However, our sounding rocket medium it requires us to get to 115 kilometers. It doesn't say anything about returning it, which is good. What else do we have? Yeah, you'll notice uh, missions to put stuff in orbit around Mercury and Pluto, just about picking the hardest planets possible. Okay, so for a polar orbit, it actually helps if you go for a, a, a launch site, which is near a pole. In this case, we're going to go for Plisets, which I have just completely butchered. Doesn't matter. We, the reason why you go with a station near the pole is because at that point, the planet is rotating most slowly because it's closest to the ax axis of rotation. So, uh, yeah, we run time forwards until the spacecraft is ready to roll out. A uh, beautiful day is dawning, but we're not going to launch right away because, of course, we need to make sure that we line up with the desired longitude of the ascending node or whatever, right? So we pick this, go to the tracking station, and we look for our target orbit. There it is, red. Pay very careful attention to those dots that are moving around it. So you want to make sure, yeah, they're going up there. So I'm going to launch northwards. But first of all, I have to get the launch site underneath this launch, this uh, orbit track. So just run time forward a little until we bisect it. Bingo. Now we are ready to launch. So I can click back here and actually go for a real launch. And the eagle-eyed among you will notice that we are launching from a tier 2 launch pad. Yes, all the new features. And immediately we're launching on four solid rocket boosters and we start to turn northwards here. We don't need to turn too much. We'll let gravity turn do the rest. But uh, Science Alert is helpfully informing me that we have not collected data from the Geiger counter or the meteorite detector while flying low over the grasslands. I'm not sure what kind of meteorites we would detect over grasslands, but you never know. You can never be too sure. Okay, so of course everything goes into time acceleration mode. We ditch these. Notice how those things explode. What happens is they are detached at basically Mach 3 or 4, and as they turn, the nose cones get ripped off of by uh, aerodynamic pressures. That's why my uh, solid rocket boosters have been exploding pretty much straight after detachment. Now you'll notice I'm burning or accelerating slightly to the west here, and that is essentially trying to cancel out what little bit of rotation the planet is giving us here. We want the inclination to be as close to 90 degrees as possible. Unfortunately, the uh, orbital data doesn't actually tell me how close I am to the required um, longitude of the ascending node. The longitude of the ascending node is where your orbit crosses the equator of the planet, right? That's what we're really measuring in this case. 
So if you imagine, although we're going exactly over the pole, the point at which you cross the equator could be all sorts of different locations, and that is part of the requirement to make sure that lines up. Anyway, yeah, we continue our ascent and realize that I'm perhaps under-thrusted or under, I don't know, underpowered just a little. So I've had to lift my nose to make sure I don't fall back towards the planet. Running on the AJ-10, remember these engines, none of these engines are really designed for orbital vehicles according to Realistic Progression Zero. Uh, there is a tech node there which unlocks the first batch of orbital engines. I have just been making do because they seem to be working quite well for me, although to be fair, I'm building rockets which are significantly larger than they would otherwise be. So as the velocity picks up and as the acceleration gets higher, I can put my nose closer and closer to the horizon here. Look at my vertical speed, just tweaking that, making that as close to zero as possible. So now bring it down. Oh, and I'm starting to fall. So use the reaction control system, put it on the dot, and then fire these engines. Now, insufficient avionics, locking controls. The good news is that my reaction control system continues to work, so I didn't need to spin stabilize this satellite. No, now we have a satellite which is running off one of these generic one kilonewton thrusters. I just unlocked these. These are obviously very small engines, but they have the advantage of being able to be activated and deactivated on short cycles. There's no limits to the number of ignitions. Now you can use this with a lot of different fuels, but in this case, it's using hydrazine. Hydrazine is a rocket fuel which has quite a long history behind it. So hydrazine is essentially two nitrogen atoms with uh, four hydrogen atoms attached to it. And when you pass it over a heated catalyst, it decomposes into nitrogen, hydrogen or ammonia in various concentrations and it releases a lot of energy. Okay, so we've completed our insertion into orbit now. I'm just raising the apoax. Got to get up to 700. Six, uh, da, 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 da. Stop. Restart. Stop. I'm going to just bang it. Bang. Come on. That's close enough for me. Okay. So that's one node and then all I need to do is set up a maneuver node at the other side of the orbit and lift the periaps up to 700. So set up my maneuver node, and then, well, then this is where I realized that launching over the pole was perhaps a poor plan. Okay, so nice thing about the pole is we will eventually pass over every biome given time. Problem with the pole is that where this apoaps position has ended up, is right over the South Pole, which means there's absolutely no antennas here to send me any commands to this. So, me being me and trying to do this normally, I uh, just wait until I get some signal and then start to work on adjusting my orbit. So yeah, we go well past our initial maneuver and we have to start kind of compensating using the engine. This is going to take a little bit of a while. So as I was saying, hydrazine is a fuel which has a long history in rocket science. It was actually used first as a rocket fuel mixed with methanol and water, I believe, in uh, the ME-163 rocket planes. They would react that with high test peroxide, which you'll notice I accidentally left a little bit off on this. When you mix them together, they were hypergolic and they released a ton of energy. These engines are in fact using this as a monopropellant. Um, and if you look, for example, there are several Mars missions that use this in the landing engines, the Viking and uh, Curiosity. So yeah, from Viking to Curiosity, they've all used hydrazine for their descent or landing engines. Anyway, as a consequence of all these extra maneuvers, you'll notice that my hydrazine supplies are getting very, very low, 1.77. So at this point, I pretty much have to only make prograde and retrograde burns. Otherwise, I run the risk of getting stuck in the wrong orbit and therefore unable to fulfill my contract. But I have managed to move my apoaps and periaps onto, well, to lower latitudes. Unfortunately, first time around when I get to the apoaps position, there was no signal. There was no uh, base or whatever nearby. 
So I, th I try to get this one in position now. After waiting a few hours, we now have a... We, well, I guess we fly over Hawaii or something here. We get connection at Hawaii, and we're ready to finally make that last insertion. Okay, fire. Just a touch. Just a tiny, tiny, tiny little thrust here. 677. I think I need to get a little closer. Is I going to hammer it on and off? The good news about these things is the valves can open and close really quickly, I guess. Okay, that should be close enough. Let's just stay still and see if I can complete this mission. Maintain stability for 10 seconds. Come on. I'm waiting. Yes! Yes, I have finally completed this contract. Man, that was way harder than it should have been. Okay, so I have a spacecraft that can, in fact, get into orbit and get into a specific orbit. I might need to make it a little bit bigger. But in the meantime, this satellite has fulfilled its function and uh, we can shut down the avionics now on it to save power so that it will continue to operate on those solar panels for many years to come, being able to collect data for me whenever I need it most. Now back at the space center, I think it's time for me to review my timing. So I was gonna have, it's gonna be 60 days before that other probe hits the moon. And uh, we still have some research going on here. Now, we now have enough science so that we can unlock basic capsules. But I want to see what other things we have to, we've got running. We have something called, and let me just check, tech. Improved instrumentation. So where is that in the tech tree here? It's, that's high speed flight, basic avionics, basic capsules, which I kind of want. Uh, where... Why do I have basic avionics on here, or whatever, improved avionics? Improved a improved instrumentation, there we go. Oh yes, because I wanted that solar panel, but apparently I forgot that I was getting a solar panel from elsewhere. I didn't know I was getting a solar panel, so you know what? We're going to research those capsules. Moreover, I think this has to go to the head of the queue, because I really want to have a manned spacecraft that gets me my reward, so... There, switch these around. So basic capsules will now get researched a bit faster. And it's telling me 123 days. Well, before then, we have a moon impact, hopefully. Unless, of course, my calculations were incorrect. And there's every chance that they will, in fact, be completely wrong. When you're on a really high eccentricity orbit, it's quite common for the moon's perturbation to cause your orbit to get really chaotic. So there we go. We've just about reached the date. And where is the lunar kicker? The lunar kicker is there. It has just departed. Oh, it's up there. I, I maybe it hasn't departed. It's just coming down this way. And then the next time around, it will, in fact, encounter the moon. So, of course, we swing by the Earth for one last look. One last data dump or whatever. It hasn't got a camera on or anything. It's just collecting good science data from the magnetosphere and the... I don't know, the temperature sphere and the pressure sphere. I don't know what. And look, it's doing sciencey stuff. It's sciencing the heck out of the space everywhere. And soon it will be sciencing the heck out of the moon at, you know... Well, very, very high speeds. Let's hope the meteorite detector works, because you could imagine the moon to be a giant meteorite. But we have crossed into the sphere of influence of the moon, and the first order of business is to collect data. We already have radiation data from here, but we have a contract to collect science data from around the moon, and I might as well satisfy it now. I was kind of wondering how long it would take for the contract to request if it, or sorry, to res um, restore itself. But uh, it looks like if, if it needs more than a day, if it needs more than 19 hours, then this thing will have finished its mission. So yeah, we're falling in towards the moon. We have vessel state. Wait a second. Ah yeah, here we go. I have to get below 5,000 kilometers. Or 5,000 kilometers for me to satisfy this mission, which I launched 100 days ago. It's kind of like, you know, it's one of those things where it's like, I totally meant to do that. I shot something at the moon and it missed it and then flew around a couple of times and then hit the moon. I totally meant to do that. Not.
I mean, I bet you Werner's acting super smug right now as he, he realizes that his spacecraft is going to impact the moon and send data back all on the way down here. So yeah, a lot of time acceleration, of course, as we begin to fall in towards the surface here. It takes hours to get in, but once we came in, our fate was sealed. I had realized that if I had ejected the capsule at the right time, or the pod at, at the right time, I could probably have had it miss the moon and then swing off into space, but I decided against that. I want to have this thing impact and collect good science data. So we're waiting for low, low altitude here. Watching the altitude gauge tick down. 400 kilometers. When? What is low altitude here? Because we're still in space high. We're flying over mid Midlands, Lowlands, Midlands, Lowlands. But we want low altitude here. Is it 200 kilometers? Nope, not 200 kilometers. Is it 100 kilometers? Let me see. 100 kilometers. Seems like an arbitrary number. Oh! But Science Alert makes its little burbly burbly sound and gives us all the data. Quick! Quick, do it all and start transmitting it back. Okay, yeah, we're going downwards at about two kilometers per se over two kilometers per second, which means our time to impact is about 30 seconds. I'm not sure I can transmit all of this data out. Go on, data! Run! Run across the airwaves! Ride like the wind! Ride like your life depended on you! Abandon ship data! All data to the exit points! Data escape! Data... I don't know... Data dump! Get out of here! You have 10 seconds to reach minimum data safe distance! 5... 4... 3... 2... 1... And we're not gonna get it out! Impact! Oh, man. Well, we didn't get all the data out, but that is probably quite a serious chunk of data for Werner and his cohorts back at the lab. Yes, this is indeed a grand achievement for our space program. Hopefully, we shall be able to scale this up and uh, scale the speed down and perhaps make a soft landing, possibly with a crew in the future. Who knows? We'll find out in future episodes. Until then, I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe. <laughs>